Jobs once said, innovation distinguishes between a leader and a follower. Organizations that are built around innovation lead their sectors and their people. How can an organization come up with groundbreaking innovation in products or processes when it is becoming so hard to even survive in a post-pandemic economy? Our guests today have become experts at innovation. Matthew Bedzina founded his mobility company, eCabs, on the basis of innovation and transformation. Dr. Leone Baldacchino is the former director of the Edward de Bono Institute for Creative Thinking and Innovation at the University of Malta and has studied innovation and entrepreneurial opportunity for years. With Matthew and Leone, we're here to discuss the innovation dilemma. Dr. Leone Baldacchino, Matthew Bezzina, great to have you here on International Insight. Matthew, everyone knows eCabs as a taxi, a mobility company. Tell us why, you know, the company is essentially, you know, uh, reflective of, you know, innovation and transformation. I believe the timeline of eCabs can be split into two. Um, uh, primarily during the first stages of eCabs, during the early years of eCabs between 2010 and 2016, the company was primarily driven by, by innovation. And when I mention innovation in terms of the way we used technology in order to scale and grow the company to a level which the industry, the sector, never experienced at the time, um, the way we implemented, implemented marketing campaigns in order to be able to identify with cohorts of customers and stakeholders which throughout the previous years never identified with the, indus with the industry in any way, shape or form. And uh, uh, the third point, which obviously um, play innovation played a massive role, was the way we um, uh, challenged a previously um, unassailable industry sector where at that time the legacy operators, you know, had regulatory capture exactly. on the industry. Yeah. And we slowly, slowly um, uh, created an environment, both on a legal level and even on an employment level, that nowadays, 12 years down the line, we have a fully-fledged sector, which is fully liberalized and, and, and growing. And not only um, having e-cabs operating in the industry, but you have the two biggest global players also, also present, present in, in, in the island. That's the first six years. The second six years were mostly driven by transformation. Right. And when I mentioned transformation, eCabs before it was literally a fleet company. Okay. And it used to use third party technology to run and grow, of which we used to build on. From 2016 onwards, we took a conscious decision to start developing and building our own IP. Okay. Why? Because at that time we realized that we are fighting a, a globe, competing on a global level in terms of customer expectations and driver expectations. And in order to be able to compete on a global level, you need the right technology. So what started that team? with a team of three developers. Today, it's a team of 65 plus developers. 65 or your company only? Which is set to double okay. in, the next, in, the next, in the next year. The team is going to double and grow, obviously, because um, it falls in line with our internationalization efforts. Exactly, and we're going to be talking a bit about that as well. So, of course, it's probably a misconception to think of eCabs as just a, 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 a taxi company, but more, there's a lot of technology inbuilt in it what is, you guys It is, primarily nowadays, it is a technology company where it owns the IP of the platform, but then it is also the fact that it's a B2C service. Exactly. It's a consumer service. Mm. Automatically, people associate eCabs with it, the fleet company, which it used to be, in fact. Mm -hmm. The Black Cap Company was the name that put eCabs on, on okay. the map. Okay. Okay. Nowadays, that we became a victim of our own success. Exactly. Because to detach yourself from the successes of the past, uh, it takes time. But gradually, 
the perceptions are changing. Absolutely. It's great, and we're going to be talking about your internationalization kind of aspirations as we go along. I wanted to introduce M. Leone in, on this one specifically. Why is it important for companies when thinking of going international to have an innovation, to have something which is, you know, highly kind of innovative in, in the product or process? Okay, I think taking a step back, we need to clarify that innovation is important not just to internationalize, but for um, competing yeah. even locally, right? And linking on to what Matthew was saying, um, you emphasized quite a lot the technological aspect of innovation, but I think it's also important to clarify that although there is a lot of innovation in technology, there is innovation in various other functions. Exactly. Various technological. Other. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So innovation essentially comes out of creativity, out of creative ideas. And many people associate creativity with the arts, and innovation with technology, but in really and truly, you can have both creativity and innovation in general. So it is important to have innovation and creativity, of course, because you can't have innovation without the creative ideas that feed into that innovation in order to internationalize. Because ultimately, what you're looking for is the possibility of offering a, a value proposition that uh, is going to be attractive in a new market, right? And a good value proposition is one that is uh, offering something that is different from, but also better than what is already available on that market. Mm -hmm. Now you could be having a new product entering a new market, mm -hmm. but you could have an existing product, an existing product here that you're going to try to enter a new market. Exactly. You could also have an existing market with a new product mm -hmm. or the least innovative, of course, is having uh, an, exist, um, an existing product and in an existing, existing market. market. Exactly. In which case, there mm -hmm. is uh, limited innovation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, research has indicated that having an innovation and good value proposition is very important to internationalize and to break into new markets successfully. Because innovation in this sense is tied to a value proposition, which is hopefully a bit, a bit unique. Matthew, in your, in your kind of plans to internationalize, you know, how, what, what, what role, would, I mean, how, how, how has the experience been so far? That's the first thing I want to ask. I think considering that um, we haven't really started marketing the ECAPS platform abroad, um, organically, the the feedback has been extremely positive. Right. And uh, the reasons are, are, are simple. One, you have a platform which has been built on 12 years of operational yeah. experience. And especially over the past five, six years, a platform that has been competing, as previously mentioned, okay. with international giants. Yes, yes. And as they say, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So the fact that eCabs is still managing to maintain and even grow market share right. in a very, very versatile market mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and whilst competing with platforms that are funding, funded and funded well, I think that is a testament of, 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 of the platform and the technology that we've right. also we've, we've, we've built. Secondly, and this is a point which um, uh, few manage to, 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 you know, to visualize is the ECAPS platform is a platform which is very comprehensive okay. in, in, the, in the way bookings are managed. All right. Okay. So we are one of the few platforms globally, especially in Europe, where we process bookings coming from different channels, okay. offline and online. So online channels are the app, the website, and API connectivity. Offline is when you book over the phone or you actually go into a taxi booth or an office. The fact that over the past 12 years we've m optimized the platform, built a platform that can manage all these booking process effectively makes the platform right. extremely, extremely um, attractive to different territories, irrespective on the size, okay. the city size, the population size, mm -hmm. and the demographics. Okay. So the European offline market is still, still accounts for 45% okay. of, of the, the general overall mobility market, market, I guess. Okay. You have secondary and tertiary cities where demographically you have customer cohorts which prefer to call. Okay. Okay. So as a platform, we've never shied away from building technology which still 
Okay. Um, uh, for, 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 which, for which there is not no demand as yet, is that? There is demand. Okay, okay. So my grandmother, mm-hmm. mobility, it's... It's still a requirement. Mobility mm-hmm. is, is a need. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And it slices through mm-hmm. the different yeah. age groups Generation. and demographics. Yeah. Yeah. So you have certain age groups which prefer who book by phone. Yeah. Yeah. So when it comes to internationalization, our USP is going to be, listen, this is a platform mm-hmm. that can easily provide a good service and meet the expectations of okay. a Gen Z. Okay. But it also manages and uh, meets the demands of a Gen Alpha right. or a Boomer. Exactly. It sounds paradoxical, really, you know, right. but there is uh, also uh, this interesting uh, slant to it that sometimes you need to be innovative in order to address some mm-hmm. a traditional need, for Absolutely. example, that many yeah. innovators sometimes tend to forget. forget. But what, what's also interesting from what Matthew is saying is that the, the kind of the rivalry locally, you know, and all this competition kind of spurs innovation. No, Leonie, what do you think? This is normal in, in, in companies kind of coming up with innovations that are relevant for markets. Well, there is always competition, especially in a small island like ours. Um, it's a very competitive market and innovation is, I think, one of the key elements that enables the company to survive and to prosper, case, case in point. Um, I think what Matthew also did with, with ECABS is that they used their experience in Malta yeah, to kind yeah. of use it as a, as a test bed. Exactly, almost. correct. So it wasn't an R&D process. It was really, like you said, operating and exactly. learning from that operation to kind of build an innovation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And when you're competing with the best, automatically, all the stakeholders need to elevate okay. to meet those expectations. Yeah. So there's like an, an ecosystem level change which happened in the Playing sector. in the Champions League. <laughs> exactly, playing in the Champions League. And that means that, that that's, that's good for innovation, Matteo? Extremely, okay. extremely healthy. It's painful in the short term, okay. but extremely valuable in the medium to long term. Right. Why? Because these people have high expectations. They, they're just aggressive competitors. Otherwise, it's very easy to be complacent, right? Exactly. Comfort and innovation is kind of, you know, the other Innovation end. is pushing oneself, pushing one's company out of its comfort zone. You need to find new ways of doing things. There's a risk involved because no matter how much market research you carry out, you never quite know whether something is really going to work exactly. or not before you launch it, before you go to market with exactly. it. Exactly. So it's, you know, it's not comfortable. Yeah, yeah, it's not. The parameters are in set and you just follow a recipe. Of and this applies not only to in the business world, it applies to everything. Yeah. There's growth when there's pain. Absolutely, absolutely. No, no, no. And, and, and you're and, measuring and, up with, 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 with uh, the best. Exactly. No, it's really, really interesting, however, that when you have a situation where there's a lot of competition, a lot of big companies, like you said, well-funded companies, I guess they have their own, you know, innovative technologies themselves, that puts you in a better position, if you like, because you're, you're under pressure and therefore you can come up with innovations um, uh, kind of more. Leonie doesn't agree sometimes. In, it depends, obviously. Okay. It depends on how entrepreneurial uh-huh. the individual and the company is. So we're talking about innovation here, yeah. but actually in innovativeness which is uh, the company's willingness to engage in innovation is one dimension of what we refer to as entrepreneurial orientation. Mm -hmm. So there are other dimensions, including proactiveness, for example. So it's not all about simply thinking about how is one going to come up with new products, new services, new ways of doing things, because one could do that reactively. Right. If a company is entrepreneurially oriented, they would do that proactively. Okay. Okay. Right. Mm-hmm. There is also a risk-taking element yeah. in it. Yeah. How willing is the company yeah, to, to uh, take risks? Mm-hmm. How willing is the company to engage in uh, competition? Okay. So competitive aggressiveness. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Right. So these are all different uh, elements that fit into each other. In fact, I wanted to ask related to that, you know, kind of the the mind frame of a, of a typical kind of small to medium-sized company in Malta wanting to internationalize is is you know the approach to innovation and the approach to risk necessarily this very you know liberal and you know completely you know all out for risk or is there kind of a, a, a middle ground somewhere? okay i think we can make a distinction here at this point between radical in- innovation yeah. and incremental innovation okay. okay incremental innovation is as the name implies um smaller yeah. step-by-step improvements to what is being done. A radical innovation is something that is completely new to the market or completely new to the world and so on. Now, as one can imagine, it is much more difficult, uh, requires a lot more resources to identify a radically new idea and to then introduce a radically uh, Mm -hmm. 
uh, a radical innovation. Incremental innovations tend to be much more attainable, much more feasible to implement, and also sometimes more proprietary as well, because when a company has a radical innovation, they tend to advertise it, of course, and that attracts a lot of attention. Because it's kind of groundbreaking, presumably. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Whereas if a company manages to engage in regular step-by-step -step incremental innovation okay. that will eventually lead to sustainable competitive advantage, okay. that could actually be a better strategy for certain companies. Right. Now, I'm not trying to say that incremental mm -hmm. innovation is better than radical or radical is better than, in, than incremental because it all depends on the business model, it depends on the industry, it depends on the resources available for the company, exactly. the size, the number of employees, mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. the funds available. So yeah. it all, it really depends on, on the context in this yeah. case. Matthew, in your case, are you guys more given what you're saying, you know, all these developers for, for a mobility company, you're kind of hoping to, you know, break new ground or go for kind of something which is more incremental? In, in definitely. So the first six years were definitely radical. Okay, yeah. Because we challenged the status quo. Absolutely, yeah. But the next six years were more incremental. Okay. So Dr. Baldacchino um, literally um, explained it perfectly. Right. So kind of you started by something which is more radical, radical, I guess because you could afford to risk more at that point? Because, because the smaller. industry at that time, the sector at that time was still in its infancy stage. Right. Keep this in mind, um, up until 2009, right. um, uh, you had no global ride hailing platforms. Yeah. yeah. And all the services were offered by localized fleets, yeah. of which they use you know, very rudimentary technology right. okay. to, to scale. But there was always a ceiling. Exactly, exactly. Whereas things now, kind of even the environment out there is changing. I want to mm -hmm. um, to kind of move a little bit. You know, okay, you, you've gone through these different phases, now hopefully for more kind of incremental innovation, but yet you have your eyes set for, for international markets. Anything you can share in terms of, you know, why would a certain region be more interesting than other and how you would you just, you know, uh, apply your innovation in Malta and plug it into another country, or there's some Definitely adaptation? Definitely, we are targeting secondary and tertiary cities. Okay. Where um, uh, you have, as I said, varying demographics, okay. Okay. which fit perfectly with our, 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 our platform offering. Um, but in the meantime, not um, losing sight or not losing opportunities if they had to pop, you know, come up, okay. if we had, you know, um, to penetrate um, uh, a major, a major, right. a major city. As I said, our platform today is being built with the expectations that it it meets the, the you know the expectations of all the exactly. of the stakeholders, respective co if they are customers yeah. or drivers. So, yeah. It, it, it really, really and truly secondary and tertiary cities. And um, once you start gaining ground, you can easily start biting and eating into, exactly. into, into other major. So it's it's, it's major, interesting major from, 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 from what I read in the sense that you have kind of a general direction, you know, going into one direction, but at the same time kind of being open to improvise a little bit. Or that's Correct. Okay. We are cognizant on the okay. challenges that lie ahead. So okay. we're not okay. taking it lightly. Okay. And, and, and uh, the partners we're partnering up within different cities, um, uh, they need to fulfill certain criteria. Right, okay, okay. Because obviously you're, you're, you're stepping up in that sense. Leonia, is, is this normal to have a company with a technological innovation like eCabs, you know, adopting a, a general uh, entrepreneurial orientation kind of with some direction but yet being a bit open to improvise? Yes, one has to be flexible. It's, mm -hmm. it's good to have a plan, it's good to have a strategy, right. one has to know the market that uh, one is at attempting to, yeah. to penetrate, but ultimately there has to be an element of, of flexibility and alertness. Alertness, okay, that's an interesting one in um, innovation now. In, in innovation and in, as we, as we say, in entrepreneurship, in opportunity identification yeah. or in mm -hmm. new venture ideation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is a cognitive process that can take place either at a conscious, deliberate level. Yeah. So yeah. Matthew said we are very cognizant oh. of, okay. right, they are deliberately um, carrying out the research, making mm -hmm. sure that they are the right partners and so on and so forth. But there is also an element of non-conscious automatic okay. recognition Explain of opportunities. That a bit to us. So some people are naturally in tune to what, is take, to what is happening in the environment, right? So there is a lot of literature, for example, on this notion of entrepreneurial alertness. They notice subconsciously 
um, when things are changing, when new needs are emerging, when new opportunities are, are taking shape. Other people do it in a much more deliberate manner. Right. But actually, um, the best entrepreneurs are able to be what we call cognitively versatile, yeah, yeah. in the sense that they use both their non-conscious intuitive processes, okay. automatic processes, but also their, uh, their deliberate um, decision-making, their deliberate analysis. Okay. Okay. Because they need to complement each other. The two processes need to complement each other. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so it's important also for uh, entrepreneurs to realize that uh, there are two ways of, uh, of identifying opportunities yeah. and also to make decisions regarding which opportunities to exploit. Yeah. And which and others to ignore or, both, or which signals both, to... Both need to be employed um, in, in tandem, so okay. to speak. Okay. Now, in terms of how does one become more cognitively versatile? I did say that some people are naturally more in tune or are naturally more alert. But it's good to note that when one repeats an action deliberately, one is automatically internalizing that process. Okay. Okay? Becoming so a bit take, of a habit. Driving, like, a habit drive, like, yes, uh, it becomes a habit. Take driving, for example. When, people okay. are, when your drivers are um, obtaining their license, they have to be very focused, mm -hmm. very concentrated on exactly what they need yeah, to do. Yeah. Eventually, it becomes second internalized. Nature. It becomes second nature. Mm -hmm. This is exactly the same thing with identifying opportunities, okay. making decisions, and so, so on. So you become good at so it because... So initially, you practice. Okay. And there are certain exercises or certain workshops that we like to carry out to our students mm -hmm. to help them uh, deliberately practice these, uh, these cognitive yeah. processes, right? The more they do it, the more internalized they become. So exactly. the better they become at automatically then recognizing yeah. opportunities. Yeah. Once then an opportunity is automatically identified or deliberately identified, again, one needs to bring in the, um, the deliberate analysis in order to make sure that one is... To kind of validate the ideas and all that. It seems to be very kind of logical and linear, perhaps. I'm not sure, you know... <laughs> it's, not, uh, it's not linear it at seems all, really actually. More, more messy than that, no? <laughs> yes, yes. And, and in fact, I wanted to ask, how, how does a company, you know, interested in making innovation central to what they do, you know, create the right structures in place? You can have some exercises of creativity, okay, but to have this balance between something structured, something which is completely intuitive okay. on a daily basis. So the practice is important, first of all, to, to nurture one's creativity. One yes. needs to practice... Uh, on an individual level, you mean? On an individual level. But then once one is a member of an organisation, yeah. there does need to be a system in place. The culture and the climate need to be conducive uh, to creativity and innovation. Okay. Okay. For example, there needs to be top-down support. Okay. So the boss has to be, um, you know, openly supportive of creative ideas of innovation that are in line with the company's vision and strategy, of course. There needs to be an element of um, allowing some risk-taking and experimentation, mm -hmm. again, in line with the strategy of the company. Exactly. So if one is trying to come up with uh, new ideas in relation to a particular target, right, mm -hmm. there needs to be an element of risk-taking because, mm -hmm. as I said before, there are no guarantees mm -hmm. in innovation. Mm -hmm. Um, along with that comes trust. Okay. So the employees, the members of the team, need to be able to trust one another and trust the boss or the bosses mm -hmm. that if they make a mistake, not through um, through not, not being careful yeah. enough, you know. Trying something that, that did not that, work. That, exactly, that doesn't work. You know, they can't be kind of concerned yeah. that... They're going to be punished for they're it. They're going to be punished or, or, or fired or whatever. There also needs to be financial commitment yeah. and because these things cost money. Exactly. Yeah. And I think one last thing that I'd like to point out in this case is that structure is not necessarily a bad thing for innovation. That's interesting. Actually having a good innovation management structure whereby everybody in the organization knows what they should do if they get an idea and what needs to be done if an idea is proposed, that is actually very conducive to innovation because otherwise, you know, if I'm uh, I'm a member of a team and I get an idea and I don't know, who should I tell? Should I tell the person sitting next to exactly. me at the next desk? Should I go straight to the So kind of there's the a structure person? and there's a way and the fora where it's safe enough to do these kind of things. Exactly. I mean, you've mentioned a lot of things which are really interesting. They really seem to be logical and they work well together. Matt, I'm not sure if in a, in a company that's competing every day, <laughs> things are so, you know, uh, happy. Um, quite quite um, correct the way, the way it was mentioned. So in our case... Um, the way we are tackling our, our internationalization efforts in terms of, of human resources um, uh, and obviously in order to 
spare innovation is by one, making sure that we organically grow internal resources. So right. we have, you have many cases of, of individuals who used to work in the operations team or used to work as drivers. Okay. And nowadays they form part of the product team. Okay, okay. So because they have enough knowledge and they can... They were on the field. Okay, yeah. That's important. That's so when it comes to designing yeah. products, mm -hmm. the best product owners and designers and business analysts are those that have experienced yeah. have been doing the, the product yeah. themselves. So if you're, you know, testing the UX UI of a driver's app or mm -hmm. a new feature of a driver's app, mm -hmm. having experience working day and night as a driver would definitely add more value. Exactly. To, and the fact that we have over 12 years of experience, operational experience in a very, very versatile market, we've managed to, we have identified a lot of, of individuals and today, I'm one of my proudest moments seeing someone who's been working with eCabs for 10, 11 years and today he's leading a product team. Okay, okay. Obviously, okay. he went through various um, training courses and studies. Exactly. So there's a structure, even, even but yet. an MBA mm -hmm. and, and, okay. and, 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 and uh, graduated lately. So, but then obviously we do understand that um, you need also external resources. Okay. External resources who have experience working in the mobility and ride hailing industries and preferably with, 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 with uh, global players. All right. And uh, those two elements will create the synergy that you need in order to continue innovating and transforming. Exactly. But I guess in, in, in creating this, 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 you know, these internal structures, which I'm sure, you know, challenging, but yet, you know, they follow this logical, you know, and kind of coherent way, um, it does make a difference, kind of the, there are people who are a bit more creative and can contribute more to innovation than others, no? There is that. How do you, how do you identify someone, like you said, you know, proud moments of seeing someone going up the ranks simply because his, his good, no, I think how, how do you, how do you cope spot? Some amounts of emotional intelligence okay. and, uh, um, uh, in the way understanding how different teams work. Yeah. So you have someone who still is working in the same in the same market, but does not have the same skill sets. Right. So you need to convince. Yeah. Through 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 the politics of persuasion. Yeah. In a in a in a um, way that is not offensive. Exactly. And uh, which is. Uh, so that the person understands that, listen, his skill sets can only arrive okay. at this level. That's, now, I'm sure that's quite easy to do. A lot of diplomacy, yes. I had a huge dose of, of uh, diplomacy. Naomi, what do you think? People are different, you know, we try to nurture people to be creative, but I'm sure there are... For sure. For sure. You have to understand how people in your team tick. Yeah. yeah. There are different people who are motivated by different things, so that is one key element that one needs to understand. How do you motivate people to, yeah. Yeah. Uh, to come up with ideas? Yeah. You know, is it simply a financial thing or are they motivated by other things as well? So I could go into a whole uh, theoretical discussion about an intrinsic versus extrinsic exactly. innovation and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, but I think Matthew has said uh, enough about that topic. Mm -hmm. But really and truly, I think everybody wants to see that they can make a difference in the place of work. Okay, and so, contribute. And contribute. Mm -hmm. So if you can understand what is going to motivate that person to, pro to um, propose good ideas, mm -hmm. and that if they are really good ideas and uh, they are aligned and the, you know, the financial resources mm -hmm. are available, they can see them put into exactly. practice. That's what I think that in itself is then going to be a motivator for, for, for follow-ups. To, to follow because people, yes. people imitate each other. Of yes, course. and of course, different people have to be involved in the process. Um, some people are good with coming up with, uh, with ideas. Other people are good with developing those ideas and implementing exactly. them. Exactly. So even if you, if you think that a reward structure is important, okay, okay. You need to be very careful as to who you are going to reward. Yeah. Because if you're own, only rewarding the originator of the idea and yeah. you're forgetting that, everyone else, then it's going to be frustrating for exactly. everybody else who's been involved. Yeah. And everyone becomes much more egoistic and not sharing, for yes. example. Yes. So this is all uh, within the innovation management structure that yeah. I mentioned exactly. um, earlier. Which seems to be kind of, you know, much more kind of structured than we perhaps, you know, taught before. Because we're running a bit out of time, I'd like you to reflect a little bit and share perhaps with us and with people listening, you know, who are interested in, you know, international business or going international with their products or services, you know, a couple of key points that they should keep in mind in terms of, you know, innovation and creativity and coming up with new things. Whoever wants to start. Okay. Clearly, um, patience. Okay. <laughs> And I think it's a virtue which you need to apply because no matter how many plans you make, 
especially in the world which we're living, um, uh, things are becoming and will continue becoming very, very volatile. Surrounding yourself with people who are better than you okay. and not being afraid exactly. to do so. Laser focus. Okay. Over the past 12 years, I had many opportunities to venture out into new businesses. Yes. And I call it the iceberg effect. So during the first six years of eCabs, when there was a lot of innovation, okay. and uh, every month it was thrilling because there's new products being, being, being deployed, new marketing campaigns, being a new market share being created. That was thrilling. The period of transformation was a period of where you had to literally focus yes, yes, yes. and lie low. Consolidate, yeah. And uh, you'll have a lot of um, opportunities which you have to sideline in order to continue working on, on, on your goal. And the last point, which I think is very pertinent, is that there's a limit to how much you can bootstrap the growth of a company. Okay. Um, uh, once you reach a point where you can't scale and grow, especially okay. you know, to meet the, the demand of, of, of the company, you immediately need to find um, uh, finance options or, or, or investors. Absolutely. Great. Words of wisdom. Leone. I so to add on to what Matthew said, um, in addition to patience, I think we also need to mention resilience. Okay. Okay. Because it's not an easy process and things will go wrong, uh, obstacles will be encountered, so resilience has to be there in order to you know, keep giving you that, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. that drive to keep pursuing your goal. Um, I think it's also important not to fall in love with one's idea. Okay. okay. Uh, Many entrepreneurs tend to do that. They have an idea. They think it's the greatest thing okay. uh, to, you know, to be offered to humankind. Um, but there does need to be an element of market research, feasibility analysis, mm -hmm. and so on. Especially if one is venturing into an international market that is not as familiar as one's one's local oh, market. Um, and of course. Uh, Understanding your market, knowing your market, and uh, perhaps if one would like to learn more about uh, innovation and internationalization, uh, we at the Edward Bono Institute offer a number of courses on creativity, innovation, and entrepreneurship. And in recent years, we were involved in an Erasmus Plus uh, project called DIFME, mm -hmm. Digital Internationalization and Financial Literacy for um, micro entrepreneurs. And we have a number of online uh, modules on the topic. So if anybody would like to follow up, um, That's they are great. all available for free online. Fantastic. Thank With you. those were Dr. Leoni Baldacchino, Matthew Bezzina, really great to have you here on International Insight. Thank you. Leoni, Matthew, thank you for giving us your insight on the innovation imperative. If you found this podcast useful, we have others on talent, key milestones, Africa, and being digital amongst others. You can find them on Spotify, on International Insights. This podcast series is produced for Trade Malta and is meant to provide insights to leaders involved in international business. The podcasts are made possible thanks to HSBC and their international business financing solutions. We get technical help from Studio 7. Thanks for listening.